Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the 79th episode of our RSM COVID-19 uh, lunchtime webinars. You're all very welcome. Uh, I'm Roger Kirby. I'm currently the president uh, of the Royal Society of Medicine. I'm very pleased that we've got two uh, world famous mathematical modelers to advise us about uh, what's happening with this Delta variant uh, in the UK uh, right now. So Graham uh, Medley from the London School of uh, Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and uh, chairman of SPY-M and Neil Ferguson, uh, so-called uh, Professor Lockdown, according to the media uh, from Imperial College, uh, are gonna join me and uh, We'll fire a few questions at them. Please do send your own questions in. Uh, they both have to disappear exactly at one o'clock to, uh, to go to a spy M meeting actually. Uh, so we're gonna have to fit in our questions rather speedily. So I won't have time to ask uh, too many of your questions. But let's, let's start off with both Graham and Neil, whoever wants to answer this, you know, where are we now with the, with the Delta variant in the UK? Give us a little, uh, overview of the, the current situation could you should we start with Graham and then go over to Neil Graham yeah so Delta variant has been growing I mean Neil's actually best place to answer this he's more on top of the data but I mean it's now the majority infection so so the comparisons with alpha uh, are interesting uh, in terms of being able to understand how our, our predictions have changed but in terms of looking forwards it's all going to be Delta from now on until the next one yeah. yeah, I don't have, I mean, so it's double, cases are doubling about every seven, eight days at the moment across the country, slight variation, place to place. 90% of cases everywhere are, are now Delta variant. Yeah, and, and so obviously it's a new variant and we're uncertain how, how things are going to go, but in terms of transmissibility and, and the, uh, the effectiveness of vaccines and then hospitalizations, I mean, I'm going to ask you to look into the future and both gaze into your crystal ball and, and tell us what, what do you think, uh, how do you see what we know now in terms of, of what it's going to be like in a few weeks from now? That's a lot of different questions at once. Yeah. Um, so we know it's more transmissible. Alpha is still going down despite relaxation and Delta is going up. Um, R of about 1.5 and it's about 60% more transmissible, a bit of uncertainty around that, but substantially more. The million dollar question is, we're going to see lots of cases in the next few weeks, I'm sure of that, but how is that going to translate into hospitalizations and of course into deaths? There's greater uncertainty there around the answer to that. Um, we have some encouraging signals and some less encouraging signals. Encouraging signals are that kind of vaccine effectiveness, at least against hospitalization for Delta is still quite high, 90% or so. Um, the less encouraging are that maybe Delta is um, more severe, generates a kind of baseline higher risk of, of hospitalization. But hospitalization now is not necessarily what we saw you know, back in January. People may be staying, I mean, from everything I hear, um, the duration of hospitalization, how many days people stay in hospital is quite low. People are perhaps less severely ill, and hopefully the protection against really severe disease and death is, is still considerably higher. But there's a lot of uncertainty. Yeah, and it's that uncertainty which is driving, really driving the situation at the moment, because at some point the government will have to uh, unlock, um, as it were, and to allow life to return to normal. And at that point, we will see a resurgence in transmission even more than we are at the moment and it's how that translates into hospitalizations and deaths and until the government really understand what that wave looks like um, clearly at the moment they don't want to take the risk uh, that it might be so large that they have to try, kind of stop it by, by reducing transmission at some point in the future um, unfortunately or fortunately depending on what you, what you look at it the only way of being able to understand how big that wave is going to be is through modeling Mm -hmm. I think the other factor and the other rationale for delay, which I think is the primary one at the moment, is that we know Delta compromises vaccine effectiveness, whether after one dose or two doses, but the effect, how much it's compromised, is great if you've only had one dose. And the next four weeks will make a substantial difference in terms of getting you know, that second dose into people's arms and people who are at somewhat higher risk of hospitalisation, we're working our way down through the age range. So hopefully, but in four weeks time, everybody over the age of four, about 40 will have had the opportunity to have a second dose of vaccine. 
that just puts us in a better situation going forward. Yeah. Um, let, let's, uh, let me ask you, you're talking about 90% uh, effectiveness of the vaccine, according to the data we have now, but that still leaves an awful lot of people. I mean, that leaves 6 million uh, people who, who, who may not be protected, even though they're vaccinated. Plus, you've got a whole uh, group of younger people and children where maybe is where they, the actual spreading of, the, of this variant is actually occurring at the moment. So, so I mean, what do we do about the uh, about that issue? Uh, do we do we look for for a vaccine that's more effective, or or how do we deal with the with the with the, that ten percent that are unprotected? I mean, that's the main argument for saying that that, that you know the epidemiological argument for for having the exit wave sooner rather than later is because any future variants that come along are probably going to be able to overcome vaccines better uh, than even Delta can. So. Um, but it's a it's a challenging question. Um, yes, future vaccines may well be um, sort of much more pan variant and, and work across different variants, uh, but we actually have to get them and to get them into people's arms, uh, and that that you know causes some kind of delay. And waiting for those, I think, is probably going to be politically unacceptable. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think the other thing I'd say, well, a couple of things. First of all. When we say 90% effectiveness, there is enormous uncertainty around those numbers, and that's part of the issue. We should steer away from quoting central estimates when we've got so little data to go on as yet in terms of hospitalizations and deaths for Delta. So, I mean, it's it's somewhere in the 80 to 95% range, with the central estimate being you know, around 90. I think the other thing is the MRI, this. this clear differences between the vaccines. And I think that will feed into vaccination policy going into the autumn, for instance, in terms of potential booster doses. Yes, vaccine effectiveness for, for Pfizer and Moderna vaccines is slightly compromised, but we're still talking about very effective vaccines, even against uh, Delta. And even AstraZeneca has maintained a lot of effectiveness that is more affected by, by antigenic variation because the antibody titers it generates are slightly lower. Um, so, but I think we will evaluate the situation over the summer in terms of what happens in terms of the third wave, how persistent antibody titers are over time. And the government is already planning for a potential booster campaign in the autumn, which will further protect the population against future variants. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little bit about restrictions because you know most people want to get vaccinated but most people don't like the restrictions and especially some conservative MPs are going crazy in the House of Commons yesterday uh, about that issue. I mean we've got the current restrictions in place and if you watch any of the Euro games from Wembley they don't seem to be uh, very constrained in terms of social distancing they're all very very close to one another. Uh, and in other locations, in restaurants and so on. So, I mean, are, do you think the restrictions we've got in place are strict enough? I mean, the, the virus is doubling every week uh, in spite of the restrictions we've got. Sure, we haven't relaxed them, but if, if, if the restrictions we've got allow the virus to double every week, aren't we going to see a massive takeoff and a, and a third wave coming unless we tighten things up? Well, we have, we have res relaxed restrictions a lot. I mean, yeah. the biggest change was probably the one which happened, you know, a month ago now, um, in terms of letting people mingle indoors um, up to certain limits. The contribution of very large mass events and, and releasing all restrictions will further amplify that. But one of the reasons that we're seeing the rate of growth at the moment is because of the level of, re of relaxation. Um, I think this is why, I mean, the key, I'm very much hoping we won't need to you know, reverse course, and I suspect we won't. Um, we will inevitably see cases and hospitalizations rise, but the key issue is that manageable level. Um, I'm more optimistic than I was that it probably will be, but the next few weeks of data collection will will inform the final judgment on that. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it's not our decision. I mean, it's a it's a societal decision, and the politicians, the people are elected to make those decisions for us. Which is how what, you know what level of, of hospitalizations and deaths are, are acceptable um, in a t in that term. So, so at the moment, it does appear that admissions, hospitalizations, and deaths on are rising, but rising at a rate at which the politicians, decision makers, are prepared to accept them at the moment. 
Uh, yeah. I, I agree with Neil. I, I find it very hard to believe that we'll have to go backwards from where we are. Uh, the next question is, is going forwards, but but it's not impossible that at some point the government will say, actually, this this number of hospitalizations is is beyond what we want to, to live with um, and, and put in place some restrictions. Yeah, well, th there are um, you know reports from Bolton about uh, a 30 percent increase in cases there and they're shipping some patients out to adjacent hospitals. Uh, I think so. There are some kind of worrying signs. Yeah, I mean, it is a question of what is acceptable. I mean, the, of course, the, the you know the, the, my medical friends in the NHS are ex exhausted at the moment from what they've been through, and they they are certainly not looking forward to a uh, a third wave, and a, so that that is going to influence the situation. Victoria McDonald, she's she often chairs our meetings for us. We're lucky to have her. She's asking about uh, whether you think that m masks and social distancing is going to continue. You know, some people say that the restrictions are going to last until February. I mean, with your crystal ball, any thoughts about how long this is going to go on for? How, how and that, is that is a government decision. It's not about being having crystal ball gazing. It's about what the government chooses to do. Yeah, yeah. And we can't predict that, I suppose. But uh, they've got pressures from both sides, haven't they? So uh, that that is uh, that is. Uh, so you, you wouldn't like to predict what. What the sort of we're going to see a third wave, aren't we, Neil? Uh, almost for certain. What the, the question is? What well, the we're at the beginning of it now. I think the key issue is how how many doublings will we get? How many weeks of rising cases? And that will depend on quite how effective the vaccines are at reducing transmission against the Delta variant, given it's more transmissible. And then the second question is how do cases translate into hospitalisations? That's the fundamental issue. And more than just the emissions. The thing which stresses the health system beyond anything else is, is occupancy. And if people, and there's a hint that this may be the case, if that people are, who are hospitalised are staying for less time, then that is all to the good. I mean, it means we can probably cope with more admissions, but still have a functioning NHS. So at the moment, we don't have definitive answers to those questions. The uncertainty spans the range of having a third wave, which maybe is 100, 200 deaths a day. Um, at peak to anything, you know, which is something which is of the scale of, of what we just went through in January. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons I think the government decided to delay to, to gather more data. There's a question from Jane McCarthy. I don't know whether you'd be able to answer this. Are you able to say anything specifically about the current position for people who are immunocompromised? You know, for example, people with blood cancers. Uh, I mean, do we know enough about this variant to say that it's it's especially risky for those that group? We don't have that sort of level of data. I mean, the a priori assumption would be the risk groups for this variant are the same as the risk groups for the previous variant, um, but we don't have specific data. Right. And then what about the issue of, of children? Uh, some evidence uh, that the, the spread at the moment is through teenagers and through younger children at school. And I suppose with school holidays coming up in July, that could be regarded as a, as a positive. I mean, any thoughts about the role of, of children and the possibility of vaccinating children? Um, Graham, do you want to answer that first? Yeah, so, so I mean, this is very similar to the previous waves we've seen. So the Alpha variant was circulating initially in schools. Um, and, and so, I think that's not unusual. We've seen that they are the people who mix the most is, is young adults and, and older children. Um, and so they're the ones who have the most highest contact rates. And so that's where virus has taken off in the past. So, so that isn't different. The question really at the moment is where, how, to what extent it gets into older populations. Um, I think the question of whether or not to, to embark on vaccinating children is, is quite challenging because of the risks involved. So you've got to compare the risk of the virus to the risk of the vaccine, but then also looking into a, you know, a longer future is uh, at what point would you stop vaccinating children and, and whether or not actually using those vaccines that you would give to children in the UK might well be better spent overseas in terms of uh, reducing the risk of new variants coming into the UK, which, which you know, will, will impair our whole vaccination programme. So I think that's really quite a challenging decision to start vaccinating children. Yeah, there's the balance of the safety versus the impact on society there. 
What, what about the issue of long COVID? Because, you know, we, t we talked about hospitalizations and deaths, but there's a bigger and bigger lobby uh, and uncertainty about how many people are currently suffering from long COVID. But I suppose it's possible that, that um, this variant might be more potent in terms of producing long COVID as well as the, the acute phase. Again, we don't I, have, yeah, I, I haven't seen any information on that, so I, I don't kind of say that. And it is, it is, to be honest, a bit of a gap in the modeling in terms of we, we don't actually look at the impact of long COVID uh, as a result of infection. Um, and that's partly more mainly because the government's focus is on the healthcare burden in terms of tertiary healthcare. I think, though, that there is being a switch at the moment towards the burden being shared more by primary care uh, as well as, as as hospitals. So, I think I think that's that's again something that needs needs careful thought. Um, I think long COVID is a significant issue, uh, but but at the moment hasn't really played into government decisions. Mm -hmm. What about the issue of travel? I mean, that's another big uh, worry in people's minds at the moment. You know, they're desperate to go off to Mallorca, where apparently the, the rates are low. I mean, do you, what, what do you think the, the impact of the Delta variant and the fact that the UK seems worse affected by this than other European countries right now is going to have in terms of, of um, people being able to travel both in and out of the UK? I mean, I think... Well, we're worse affected just because we receded more and we have more historical um, links with India. Um, but we're seeing the Delta variant start to establish itself in the United States at the moment and other countries. And what we saw with the Alpha variant is that you, the rest of Europe was a month or two behind the UK. Um, so I don't doubt that it's going to become established almost across Europe uh, over time. Um, I think the key issue around travel is a political one, but obviously there's a lot of discussion in the papers this morning, indeed the last few weeks, about the idea of vaccine passports. And certainly from an epidemiological perspective, having fully vaccinated people travel poses less of a risk, not a zero risk, but less of a risk than having people who haven't been vaccinated travel. And so I suspect we will see something along those lines mm -hmm. evolve in the coming weeks. Yeah. The, um, the, do you think, um, looking back, do you think that the, the delay in, in stopping those flights in from India were, were, has led to the, the seeding that you mentioned there? Should, should they have stopped those flights in from India sooner? Again, it's a bit of a political issue. Yeah, I, I think, uh, but uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm pretty sure that the, the Delta variant would eventually become established. Uh, in the way that it is, we 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 were the first because of that travel. Um, had there been less travel, then maybe it would have been delayed, um, and maybe it would have been different because we would have had a much more highly vaccinated population. But actually, it, in the age groups it established in wouldn't have been vaccinated anyway. So, so I think it's a moot point um, to discussion. I think the lessons of it are though that travel restrictions mean that variants move. You can reduce travel um, and slow down those movements of those variants, but you can't stop it completely. Well, that sort of begs the question of whether Australia and New Zealand can sort of cut themselves off from the rest of the world indefinitely, or are they? Do you think they're they going well, to? I, I mean, I think the lessons are that if you take the policy of Australia and New Zealand, then it can be effective. But anything much less than that is at best slowing things down. I mean. A paradox. It, one of the things this last experience with Delta in the UK has highlighted is that home quarantine for travellers just doesn't work. Um, I mean, everybody coming in from India in April of this year was meant to quarantine at home 10 years for 10 days, and but it still established itself. So I think we need to think carefully about the extent to which travel restrictions are really intended to be inf effective, in which case they have to be quite stringent. Um, or we adopt a different strategy. Anything in between is, is to some extent window dressing. It's more posturing than actually anything with an epidemiological impact. Yeah. And, and in terms of New Zealand and Australia and, and other countries that have that have adopted this uh, elimination uh, approach, I think you know they are facing a very different challenge and a significant challenge because they are going to have to have an exit wave as well. They, they will fully vaccinate before they open up, I'm sure. But when they do, they will be in the same position that we are now, only slightly worse because they won't have the immunity developed from natural infection. 
and, and so New Zealand is actually going to have to have an epidemic uh, at some point unless it wishes to keep its borders closed um, forever. Yeah, well, I know you, you, you mainly focus, both of you focus on the UK situation, but I mean, I read somewhere that there are 94 countries now where the Indian variant is, is becoming the dominant variant. So are we ahead of the rest of the world in terms of, well, I suppose India is the... the well, we, we have much better, one of the things, it's hard to judge because a lot of the countries where it's got established have much poorer data, particularly sequencing data on the virus. And so one of the reasons the UK appears to be the head and have the most cases of, of any variant is because we sequence more cases than anywhere else. But it is a problem in multiple countries and multiple continents right now. And just to say, put, I mean, the UK's position in context, we are now in a much, much better position than much of the world. I mean, Brazil is still has been seeing over 2000 deaths a day since beginning of this year is still seeing over 2000 deaths a day in catastrophic um, experience. So we can thank, thank Kate Bingham and her ordering of the vaccines for that. We had her uh, on our, one of our programs a few weeks ago and uh, yeah, it's great that she's been uh, recognized. There's a good question from Gillian Oatley um, for, you, for you, both of you really. Do you think this pandemic will eventually burn itself out like Spanish flu did rather than us having to live with it um, for indefinitely, which you know is kind of what the government message is so again it's a the Spanish flu didn't burn out it became an endemic disease yeah um and then we're still living with the descendant of the Spanish flu pandemic influenza virus today in fact um in, in the globe of what we were until 2009 pandemic but even there it's, it's genetically related I mean I expect with COVID being COVID now is more transmissible than any flu virus I mean, it will become endemic. We will have probably a period if we get to a high level of immunity of very low transmission. Um, but new people will, children will be born into the population, new people will come into the country. And as soon as the pool of people who don't have immunity is large enough, circulation will, will restart. So, I mean, it's a kind of class, it will become a classic endemic respiratory disease, which we manage probably through vaccination. Yeah. And then, then Graham, I mean, that leads on to the question about future variants. Again, it's speculative, but um, we're gonna ha are we going to have to go through the whole Greek alphabet and then back to the beginning again uh, with, with variants coming down the line with this virus, do you think? That's the, that's the best guess. I mean, it is a guess, but I think that is the best guess. I mean, having, you know, we've had Alpha and we've had Delta as two major variants that have become dominant. So to pretend that it's not a chance that there won't be, a, you know, what the next one that, that will come along. Uh, whether the linear naming system survives, I don't know. I, I mean, it certainly make, it makes it easier to, to call them by those labels, Delta and, and so on. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure at some point someone will start talking about the, you know, the, the Kappa, the Kappa new variant and, and so on as, as the gets goes back to being like sort of more, more scientifically based. Uh, but yeah, I, I expect variants to be go on forever. I mean, the, the, the endemic coronaviruses that we have evolve, um, all viruses evolve. Uh, and and, and the, as long as this coronavirus remains endemic, and I agree with what Neil just said, it, it, it very likely to, it will continue to evolve. So the, the question really is, is to what extent it impinges on health um, rather than on infection. Um, and, and it's hard, hard to see at some point there will become a transmissibility limit, I guess, but then it's about pathogenicity. Yeah. There's, actually, there's a comment from Sean McBride Stewart saying that the NHS is more than acute hospitals and increasing cases, you know, puts pressure on primary care, GP practices, etc. Um, as he says, there's not enough appreciation of that. I think that's quite a good point. And then um, Faye Sandler makes the point about, you know, apart from vaccination, you know, again, looking into the future, uh, you know, what sort of changes in society do you think we're going to have to to introduce to live with this. I mean, you know, off spaces in the office, ventilation, she points out, is uh, maybe important in reducing transmission. I mean, again, looking into the future, our, our lives are probably going to change forever, aren't they, after this? this well, pers personally, my view is that, they, that that will be driven by personal preference and, and not driven by the virus. I think that in, in a couple of years, everyone who's going to 
die from it will by and large have died from it um aside from lot you know a few people losing immunity um and the just the changes that remain will be societal in the same way that there were changes introduced presumably in in 19 in 1919 um, but they carry on even though the virus, you know, we, we don't put special measures in to deal with the flu. Um, and, and in the same way, I don't think we'll have special measures in, you know, in to deal with the coronavirus, this coronavirus. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting. I think there will be, I mean, a lot of people have got used to working from home. Some people quite like it. And clearly there will be this, you know, massive event in everybody's lives will have long-term consequences. But I agree... I mean, once we have got two doses into everyone, um, immunity is sufficiently high, we shouldn't need to continue social distancing or ventilation measures. I mean, that should be sufficient. Yeah. Tony Devine is saying a um, slightly controversial question. He says, in view of the fact that your modeling doesn't always turn out to be absolutely predictive of real life data, I mean, do you think that your modeling now is, is better than it was, you know, 18 months ago when all this kicked off. I mean, how, how, how accurate are your predictions now? That's what he's really asking, I suppose. Well, so different, <laughs> different things. I mean, the roadmap stuff, they're not really predictions, they're scenarios deliberately looking at a wide range of uncertainty and basically asking the question, how bad could things reasonably become? What's, you know, what's the feasible range of output? So we're not attempting exact predictions with those. Graham can tell you about the kind of short-term projections by M generates. Those are a different thing. Yeah, I, I absolutely. I think there's a bit. There's a, the modelling is being misrepresented in a way, in the sense that the people say, "Oh, look, it didn't happen." That's partly because measures were put in place to prevent it happening, uh, and we don't pretend that we can quantitatively predict. We're not. We're not pretending that we can say that there will be this many deaths at this date. But we can say that the numbers of deaths will increase over, over the coming weeks as infection in, in, um, increases. Um, and, and that imprecision is absolutely clear in terms of the modelling. Yeah. I mean, we, we do know an awful lot more about COVID now than we did a year ago. Mm. I mean, the data is, is, we have overwhelming amounts of data. Um, we understand the disease a lot better. But one of the things, for instance, we can't, easily predict is, you know, how will the population respond to any particular change in government policy? What will that translate to into contact rates? And as long as we are not able to predict that, it's very hard to make truly predictive mathematical models of the future trajectory of the epidemic. Mm -hmm. oh, I think it's impossible now. Yeah. And I suppose there's the, you know, there's the, the uh, sub some uh, population who, who will refuse to get vaccinated. The anti-vax uh, uh, lobby is pretty pretty uh, intense on on social media and so on. So there are a lot of people giving dire predictions of what might happen to you if you get vaccinated. And, and we included that that in in the kind of modelling that we did back in February is that we had to include because of that uh, some variability in terms of coverage. We didn't know what the coverage was going to be. It turns out that although there might be a very vocal subgroup, they are a, a quite a small subgroup and the coverage has actually been very high. Um, and, and, and you can criticise the modellers for saying, well, you only included a coverage of 60% as a lower limit. Um, when it turns out that over 85% of people have been vaccinated, well, well that's, you know, again, part of that imprecision that, that, that Neil's talking about is we can't actually predict what it is that people are going to do. Yeah. And I know it's not your call, but a, a third vaccination in the autumn for for everybody is, is do you think that's a realistic possibility? I think it's a possibility. It's not our call on it, but I mean there are some benefit. We don't know, for instance, how long lived immunity is to this virus or vaccine induced immunity, and there are going to be risks of other variants which potentially can escape vaccine induced immunity more. So. There is a clear rationale for thinking about boot the booster program. It is being considered, but it will be for JCVI and the government to announce. Sure. And, and I guess every pharmaceutical company that's in the vaccines business is looking uh, looking to develop a vaccine that might be helpful in that, that situation. 
Listen, it's, it's one o'clock now. And I know you uh, chaps both have to go to your spy meetings. Last question is, um, what, are, what are these spy meetings like? Are they jolly or do you argue uh, like hell with each other about the, what's going to happen next? Greg, so, the monster of a chair. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so far, we have managed most meetings in a, in a very sort of friendly sharing kind of way. I mean, we, we're doing this um, for you know, a wider benefit. Um, and whilst we disagree with each other, I mean, the phrase that we use a lot is tell me why I'm wrong. Uh, we disagree with each other. We challenge each other. Um, but but we're doing that to help us, eat, you know, all understand uh, and be able to provide the best advice we can. Great. Well, uh, I, th I think you did both of you. Fantastic job. And you've done, thank you so much for appearing on our program. So we'll let you get off and spy on each other and uh, keep up your your happy dialogue that you've just described. Thanks a lot. Farewell. Uh, so just my job now to uh, finish a little bit early uh, and just to tell you about uh, what you can expect from uh, the RSM next week. We've got a, an exciting week next week. Uh, in fact, we have um, a on Tuesday, we have our climate change uh, session at six o'clock in the evening. If you log on at uh, RSM live, you can uh, watch that for free. Uh, next Wednesday, Celia Kitzinger will be talking to me in our 7 p.m. In Conversation live series. Uh, and Celia's got a very personal story about her sister, Polly, who had uh, brain damage in a, in a car accident. Uh, and she's, she's, she'll be talking a lot about the ethics of the management of people who uh, have brain injuries and other, uh, uh, other impairments. Um, so that's on Tuesday. And then on, uh, on Wednesday, we uh, are talking about um, uh, more international aspects of COVID-19. Claire Bainton, one of our trustees, will be uh, joined by David Heyman, very influential uh, epidemiologist. And uh, she, uh, David will be talking to her about vaccinating the world and about the issue of uh, vaccinations in, um, in poorer countries and, and so on and so forth. Um, just also to remind you that the RSM building is now open, not just our restaurant, but our library, our club uh, and our hotel facilities. So you're very welcome to join us there. Please do, because we have been impacted uh, financially by the uh, pandemic, just like everybody else. So we really need to get people into our building. And of course, you can always join the Royal Society of Medicine. You don't have to be a clinician. Uh, or a scientist to join. We take anybody who's interested in, in medicine and healthcare as potential members. So do consider joining. And um, finally, to say that uh, these webinars are free to you, but they're not free to us. And although they're sponsored, uh, if you would like to make a donation to the Royal Society of Medicine to keep uh, this show on the road, our, uh, particularly our webcast shows on the road, we would really love it uh, if you were able to support us in that respect. So uh, for everybody that's listening, I think we had almost 2000 people um, tune in for this. Um, thank you for listening to our webinar and I uh, hope we'll see you at uh, several of our webinars next week. Goodbye for now.